And the next speaker is uh, Lynn Sund Hansen, a colleague from Nina. Uh, and Lina is an aquatic ecologist and uh, working a lot with the salmon. And uh, um, is a senior research scientist uh, at Nina and is also the leader of the work package that is related with the environmental in the Hydrocene Center. So the, it's so-called the environmental design. And I would like to thank Lina to be here today because it's a very special day for her. Happy birthday, Lina. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll then continue and uh, I'll let you know when it's two minutes. Yes. Ooh. Okay. Uh, thank you for the applause before I've started. <laughs> um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about expanding the concept of environmental design using case NEA. And you heard Atle Harbi uh, earlier today talk about environmental design. And um, that was a concept developed for salmon in regulated rivers. And in this project, we wanted to you know, expand not, not just focusing on Atlantic salmon, not, uh, not focusing Atlantic salmon at all, actually, going into an inland river uh, with the challenges we find there in a regulated river, and also taking into account uh, other parts of the ecosystem. This is the handbook of envir environmental design that Atle talked about earlier. So, uh, in this case, uh, it's an inland river. Uh, we also added ecological elements and people, biodiversity, recreational use, and landscape perception. And uh, with the experts, it's a very much team effort with experts from different fields that have contributed to this work. And here you see River Nea. It's not that far away from Trondheim, actually. I'm going to find it there. We are about here, and the river is about an hour away from us. And it's regulated. Um, it's regulated since the 60s. And the tunnel here, the first water from further upstream. So a big part of this river stretch has uh, uh, reduced flow. And no, uh, no environmental flow in winter. The blue, um, the blue color here is all the weirs. There are 32 weirs in 20 kilometers. Uh, so there's a challenge, and it's regulated by the hydropower company Statkraft. And uh, when we started this project, Statkraft was very much a part of the project and also local stakeholders, and we tried to work together when establishing uh, the aims for the project. A bit of a background. Historically, the river was very important for the large brown trout population. It's, uh, it's this specific population of brown trout that we find in the lake that River Nea runs out into is known for its big size and that it used River Nea as a spawning river. Um, have some challenges like reduced discharge um, and that all these weirs may act as barriers for, for instance, spawning uh, brown trout. And then we also have other challenges, such as introduced non-native species to this region, such as the European minnow and pike. Um, so what we set out to do here in this project was to map recreational use. Uh, there was a PhD, Håkon Sund, who used the green lidar mapping and hydraulic modeling for modeling the river. Uh, there was a survey done by Betty Kuller of attitudes towards weirs and uh, mitigation measures that were already done like river in river. Um, also mapped present and potential spawning areas. Um, and then we also compared traditional sampling of invertebrates with like new methods such as eDNA. And we also did this genetic kinship analysis of juvenile trout to estimate population size and genetic stru structuring and population fragmentation to see the impact of migration barriers. 
So this is one of the barriers which we think might be a problem. You can see it might be hard to pass when the discharge is low for, say, a spawning trout. So first, this, uh, the river was mapped using green lighter uh, and the, a, a digital river model was built. Um, and it was used to describe habitats and conditions for, for the fish and other organisms in the river and to simulate different discharges and mitigation measures, like, for instance, removing a weir and how that would impact the water-covered area. Um, then there was a study being done on the river and the landscape and how people perceive the river. And the thing is that this river is very important for local people and also for tourists. And the, in, in this example here, uh, the survey tested how people perceived uh, the river when the weir was removed. Um, here, it's, it's, it's the, the, the picture has been manipulated. And people were in general, um, this is actually a picture of the mitigation measure called river in river. Uh, so the river has a channel here in, you can hardly see it from this, <laughs> this angle, but there's actually a channel here with a, with a, a deeper, uh, where the depth is a bit deeper than it would be if the water were just covering the whole riverbed. And uh, people perceived it quite negatively when they did not have any information why we should do this, why this measure had been done. And locals, <laughs> I see it's Norwegian now, but it's locals on top and tourists here on the figure on the bottom, how they perceive this without any information. But their attitude towards this mitigation measure uh, was very different when they were received information that it might be, or that it was actually to... Uh, mitigate uh, hydropower regulation and it would improve conditions for brown trout. So information is important. We're also fishing for answers. And uh, we used uh, genetic analysis to look at uh, the state of this population. And we found lots of uh, sibling pairs in all ages. So zero plus, that's a uh, a young of the year, one plus is one year old, and so forth. And uh, it was not a very good sign uh, with that many siblings and half-sibling pairs in such a big river. And the map sort of shows that we found these families within uh, geographical, like within certain areas of the river, and that these uh, pink bars here were weirs, and they actually impacted the genetic uh, makeup of the, of, of the structure of the population. And we found a very low uh, spawning population, uh, 156 effective spawners for young of the year, which is much lower than you would expect from such a big river. So we found that the weirs had a very negative impact, actually, and it was actually quite inbred population because of this. And then the, the, the spawning habitat was mapped, um, looking at both the potential spawning areas, but also the existing spawning areas. Um, and we found that quite a few weirs had been built on, on the, the spawning grounds itself, so they were not in use anymore. But they have a potential to become better. Also, we looked at uh, biodiversity or invertebrates using both kick samples, the old, the traditional way, and also comparing it with e water samples, eDNA, and actually also analyzing the ethanol that the kick samples were put on to find the best way to, to assess the invertebrates in the river. And what we found was we actually had Pre, uh, we had samples from before regulation in this river, and this is like how many species we found with a different with the different methods. This is water samples uh, being analyzed with eDNA. This is barcoding of the, uh, the ethanol that the kick samples were put on, and this is morphological, like an expert going through the, the kick samples manually. 
but we were missing 72 species that we were expecting to find, but did not find. So reduced biodiversity. So to sum up, we found that the spawning stock of trout was very small, inbred and fragmented because of the weirs, stopping fish from moving upstream and downstream the river. The weir pools were also less productive and had lower bio biodiversity than the rapids. Uh, however, the weirs are important for people's perception of the landscape. Um, but there is acceptance for changing them to improve conditions for trout invertebrates. And without weirs, the river would become like a desert or a rock desert because it's so wide and has reduced discharge. Um, so we have to take that into account. And that the river has several spawning areas which are not being utilized, as it is not for now. And we also have to consider that pools are important for like an overwinter uh, air um, habitat for, survival, for trout. So how can we improve conditions here? We have uh, suggested, um, uh, in, this is actually a report, and we have suggested modification to these spheres and also removal of some. And our main aim is to establish connectivity to spawning grounds. Um, uh, both upstream and downstream, uh, using, for instance, this uh, ramp weirs, I think they're called. This is from Norris's Tiltag's own book. Not really sure what it is in Norwegian, but yeah. And this is an example of, of, of such a, new, uh, a weir which we think would improve conditions in there. We also have suggested this is uh, using water in a different way than they releasing more during spawning, uh, the spawning time for brown trout and maybe saving uh, water in other periods. And um, we think that this suggestions of modifications of weirs and water use will improve conditions and remove some of the bottlenecks that are there now for both invertebrates and brown trout. And uh, we, are we are continuing to cooperate with Statkraft and the en Environmental Agency and the Energy Agency to try to come up with um, the next move. And it's, it's, I guess it's also up for revision this river now. Um, so it will be exciting to see what happens in the future. Thank you very much.